Afghanistan was like something you couldn't imagine it unless you've really been there. Uh, I'm lucky to have a, a really wonderful partner who understood it's what I wanted to do, what my mates wanted to do, and she was happy for us that we were going. Uh, obviously, yeah, that camaraderie with your mates, you're very excited to go. You're getting a chance to do your job for real and hopefully make a difference. But when you actually get there, unless you've been to Afghanistan, it, it's, it is so, so hard to describe. But Afghanistan is really something else, both culturally, with, with how, how, they, how the, the local population are, and, and just the landscape and, and the environment. It is, it is really something else. Places on, on a trip are, are highly sought after, and, and guys really, really compete at the unit, in fitness-wise, in military skills-wise, to, to get that place on the trip. So you feel that sense of achievement, like, yes, we're definitely going. And in your mind, I was a little bit older, so you need to ask yourself some of the tough questions, like, what if this happens over there? What if there's, you know, child, female suicide bombers, which, which have been the case, like, can you, can you take care of that problem if it arises? So... Yeah, def you definitely need to ask yourself some tough questions before you, you're ready to go. I'd seen a little bit more of the world and I was probably a little bit older than most guys at 1RR. I mean, I was, I was 30 in Afghanistan. Um, my best mate turned, turned 21 over there. That, that was about the average age of most other diggers, so I'd had a little bit more life experience. There's a, there's a massive culture of, of fitness. I mean, my best mate, I had to remind him that, that he, before leading up to Afghanistan, I had to remind him that he was 20 and I was 30. He'd knock on my door three times one Saturday, we're going to train, we're going to train, we're going to train. So we did three sessions in one day, like morning, lunch and afternoon. And then when we got to Afghanistan, I think we ran 400 metres just when we first got to TK and you're nearly gassed, like, the dusty climate and then the altitude, it is something you really, I don't know how you prepare for that in Australia. It is just incredible. Um, we did a lot of patrols on the ground with the CO. And uh, so, yeah, we got to see a fair few different patrol bases and move around a fair bit and didn't really see a lot of TK. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good experience that way. You definitely very aware of, of IEDs when you head to Afghanistan. So initially on the ground, your you, SOPs, your standard operating procedures and stuff, before you get out of a vehicle, it, you need to be so aware of where you put your feet. And I guess the first week or two, it almost takes over and you become paranoid. And until you get used to the, the landscape that you're working in and what's going on, the first week or two can really, really do your head in. You, you're very almost overcautious about where you put your feet and and things like that. I think the July is probably a very painful day for me, both <laughs> more mentally than than physically, and, and probably will be for the rest of my life. Uh, 18th of July started at around 1am, so there wasn't much sleep before that because we knew we were, we were heading out in the dark on a patrol down to harass or, or stop an insurgent uh, known bomb making facility. So we were told it was a 3k patrol but it, it, was, it was probably double that length. Uh, pretty unforgiving climate where you're slipping over all the time uh, in the dark, very hard to to get a gist of, of where your feet are and things like that. Uh, we got to our destination, I think roughly at about 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we were the, one of the last, last sections. So from that, what you can gather is the engineers, everyone had been through before us. People had walked exactly where we were walking They'd swept with their mine sweepers. 
and and deemed clear. Even though that happens, you still have to be really diligent about where you put yourself and and what's what's around you. We were there probably for around two hours. I was the gunner, so I was, I was behind a Mag 58 with a belt rig, and contrary to a lot of what a lot of newspapers have reported that I was walking and stood on something, that I rolled on something. You, you cannot roll with a full a full belt rig behind a Mag 58. That 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 did not happen. So basically, we were there for around two hours. Uh, I had my weapon pointing, just covering down over one of the, the koalas. Uh, my section was just a few metres behind me. And all of a sudden, after around two hours, something went off. I honestly thought it was maybe a suicide bomber because we'd had some local population around. And the big, the big tell sign with IEDs is the locals won't go anywhere near. They've normally got a fair idea where an IED is. So clearly even the locals didn't know this one was in the ground, sitting just behind us. So basically I just remember the dust. I was lifted into the air. I landed and thought, yep, yeah, suicide. One of these locals must have had a suicide vest on or something like that. The dust was starting to clear. Uh, my right ear was just ringing. It it blew blew out my right eardrum. The first thing you want to do is make sure the guy beside you is okay. Uh, I tried to crawl, looking for Ben, and realised that wasn't working too well. I uh, looked down, and and my right leg was was gone just below the knee. I didn't see what was left of it. Didn't know where the boot or anything below that was. It was just clean gone. Uh, from that point, I looked up and saw one of the other guys in my section rolled onto my back and just, just said, mate, I need some, mate, I need some help. And that's when, when the guys started working on me. I will never have a, a 10 out of 10 pain experience ever again in my life. Never. Um, I, I'm not at all trying to sound heroic or glorify this in any way. It's not a nice situation to be in. But I, I really, I still had to find out where my, my mate was or the closest man to me was. And I kept asking the guys, you know, where's Ben, where's Ben? From from the no response or from the fact that they were trying to lead me onto something else. I guess I, th I think I knew what had happened. So I was pretty conscious. I remember my veins were, were collapsing. So um, they had to figure a way out of getting, getting fluid into me to, to keep me going for a bit. So they got out this a drill type thing and basically drilled into my arm until I hit the bone, which honestly was more painful than my leg. I'll, I'll never forget that. And uh, But it kept me alive. Like they fed fed fluids in through, I think through the marrow or however they, they, they do that. My mate, he, he stayed beside me the whole time, talked me through it and I think really kept me going because at, at one point I thought, I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. I thought I just thought I'd bled out. So I really need to thank him for to keep for keeping me going at that time as well. The the Kazabat came at a ridiculously quick time because we were out in a reasonably isolated area or a fair way away from from the base or any any type of base really. The uh, the guy who, who was on the radio, the SIG, he got that the nine liner in so quick. I had a chopper to me in around 16 minutes, I think I was told, which was just, yeah, insane. Probably saved my life because I, I honestly thought I was going to bleed out. I remember getting 
off the chopper and talking to a captain, Doc Challen, just before I went into surgery. I remember that. And then everything kind of a little bit foggy, obviously, as you go into surgery. I remember waking up and looking around this room saying, hoping Ben was going to be in a bed beside me. But he wasn't. I think, first of all, after what had happened, you're thankful for the chance of recovery. You know, my mate was killed, so that, that really puts things in perspective. You don't have time to, to stop and, and whinge or whine about your recovery. You, you get to see your loved ones again. But recovery was definitely very long, and I want to thank the American forces. They, oh, firstly, the Dutch surgeon that did all my surgery in TK, American forces that, it's their hospital in Germany, they I had sur plenty of surgeries there as well. Just magnificent people. And then back in Australia, I think I had around 14 or 15 surgeries to get my leg closed up and, hope, and, and try and get to start, start walking. That was my next mission. Uh, I was up walking on a prosthetic 10 weeks after the blast. So it's, which is a, I don't really know how to describe it. It's a very unusual time. You need to trust this thing that's not, not part of your body. You're not, you're not used to it. You need to really get some trust, which, which takes a bit of time. I'm still quite bitter about it. I do not think the ADF was prepared for what was going to come out of Afghanistan. And they really should have been. I mean, this country's built on the traditions of Anzac. We've been fighting wars for a little while now. Like, it really felt like had we learnt nothing from Vietnam and the way guys were treated then, Iraq, the same sort of injuries, blast injuries, although Iraq is a different climate altogether, the same sort of injuries were coming out of Iraq. They had, they honestly had had no idea how to treat injuries. They really do not know how to handle things like post-traumatic stress. And, and they really should. Well, it's, they should have done risk assessments before we went over there. I mean, they were looking, when I first got back to 2HSB, they, they looked through the phone book to find prosthetic places and just sent me to a few, a few of the first one I went to, this guy says, well, you'll never run again. So I just left. That's not the kind of people I wanted dealing with me. Little things like that really, really make me upset. You'd think that the army would be a lot more prepared. And then in terms of physio and things like that, I'd have a physio session on base that maybe went 20 minutes and they said, we can't get you in for the next three weeks, we're booked out. It, it makes me quite angry, to be honest. I think talking to a few majors and the such that work with, with ASWIP or the wounded, the wounded sector of Army, a lot of different things have been put in place since to help out wounded guys and their families. But in 2009, clearly no thought had gone into it. The general society in Australia, I, I don't think they understand our mindset and, and I get that. Unless you've been to Afghanistan, you, I don't think you will understand what goes on there and what we're doing there. But you feel a real sense of our mates have given everything. We need that sacrifice not to be for nothing. And, and that's that's the majority of the opinion of the people that, that want to be deployed and want to go over and do their job. You don't want your mate's lives to be for nothing. The fact that a mate, a mate was lost, that, that is what really, really hurts. And, and you feel a thing called survivor guilt. My mates are everything to me, even though I've recently left defence. You'll never have mates like you have in the army or on a deployment. You eat together, 
you sleep on the ground next to each other. Everything you do, you, you fight together, you work together. You'll never, but they're so important in that recovery process. I felt a real sense of disconnect because most of my mates were still on deployment. They weren't returning home until February 2010. Uh, things like Facebook would help me try and get in contact with them every now and again, but it really wasn't the same until I, I got them home and, and could talk, talk to them. PTSD is a really, really strange beast, I suppose. I don't, I don't quite know how to understand it or put it in any type of context. And individuals, even in the same circumstance, PTSD will affect them in very different ways. For, for a period, I don't think I left my house for around six months. When, when PTSD was at its worst, I was just shut off to the world a little bit. Uh, probably addicted to painkillers for a little while. I felt if I, even family, if I had to deal with people, I needed painkillers to get me through it. Uh, once I, that went for probably maybe six months as well. Um, I just don't know how to describe it unless you've it's another one of those things unless you've really been through PTSD I, I can't really explain it I lost direction I'm, I'm lucky with my partner she she's an amazing person she said to me you've always achieved things in your life you've been an athlete you've been you went to Afghanistan, you, you've, all, you've ticked all the boxes that you wanted to do. Why are you so happy to sit around and do nothing now because the army has nothing for you? And honestly, after a little bit of an argument and, and I walked away and thought about it, she was exactly right. I had some doctor in Canberra telling me that I couldn't touch ammunition or things like that even though I was on no medication for around a two year period. And without that, I had no progression. I couldn't, I couldn't advance my career in defence. I couldn't do, I couldn't do much. And in, in my mind, that was, that was really starting to eat away at me and, and make me very unmotivated and not the person that I am. So I've decided what's best for me is to move on I recently completed a diploma in occupational health and safety and a Cert 4 in trainer assessor and I, I, I need to achieve things. I feel blessed now, I've, I've got two young children, I've got a really good life. I, I don't have time to say what, what did this happen to me. I regret nothing, even early on I said to my partner, I would go back tomorrow for the chance to to finish the finish that fight. It's something that I believe in. My your mates your mates are what what makes being a soldier special. You eat together, you sleep on the ground together. Everything you do, they're, they're closer than your family over there. You trust the man next to you with your life and you'd expect he would do the same. It's, that's what makes you proud, not the unit you're from, not who's the CO at the time, 